We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Now, tonight's question comes from Carlos L., who writes, I just discovered the podcast about a month ago, and so far, I'm a quarter of the way through your archive. That's, I don't know if I can go through our archive. <laughs> Work backwards. At least then you got to hear the good stuff first. <laughs> All right, I have quickly become a fan of the show, and I awesome. really appreciate the wealth of knowledge that you both bring to the tabletop community. I'm going to say that's a little bit more towards Mo on that one, but I just try and organize it a little bit. Now, I'm a stay-at-home dad with my wife and two young girls, and while I'm a burgeoning fan of hobby games, I can't quite say that I've managed to get the rest of my family on board yet, but that's for another day. How to rook your family into gaming. Tune in next episode. No, no. My question for you is this. What do you think are some of the best tips for protecting your games and keeping them in good condition? Of course, games are fundamentally meant to be played, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I'd like to take good care of them so that, hopefully, one day when my family comes around, they'll still be in good shape for all of us to enjoy. I've heard lots of debate about if boxes should be shelved horizontally or vertically, how many boxes can be safely stacked upon one another, if cards should be sleeved, how to shuffle cards without bending them, silica gel packets, and the like. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, Carlos, for the great question. I love these long-form questions. These are my favorite ones to get, right? Like our goal here at Tabletop Bellhops to be a Dear Abbey for gamers. I love getting the Dear Abbey long kind of explains where they are and not just hey tell me about good trick taking games definitely appreciate that so thank you for that um it seems you've already done some research and i i think it's kind of cool you're kind of looking to us to say like what do you guys think because i've read all these different opinions so i i appreciate your uh faith in us to give you the right answer though this one will be a bit interesting because sean and i are kind of on different sides of the fence for this whole thing and the big thing i will be talking about though is options not necessarily options we have chosen to use. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can approach this. And a lot of it is going to depend on what sort of collector you are, or uh, if you go back a few episodes, where in your uh, board game path, life path, are yeah. you? Um, if you are into the collecting and the, and you know, if you are thinking about future value, uh, or even this, you know, passing on to future mm -hmm. generations, you may want to think about things a little bit more uh, stiffly than if you are just out to buy some games and play them and enjoy them. Yep. Uh, and what happens happens. Now, another thing you should be looking at is how often your games get played. It's going to matter a lot more if you play your games at public play events where anyone from the public come in and grab your game and set up in a corner and you got 200 possible people there, all who could be sharing and talking and reboxing and tossing things around and you can't watch everyone how they take care of your game versus you've got your own game group. You've got 50 games and you play maybe this one, one week, this one, another, you've got games you played 10 times and yeah, there's that shelf over there with games you haven't played yet, which I think is more the average gamer nowadays, the average hobby gamer. The more you use your games and the more use they're going to see, the more you might want to consider protecting your games. Absolutely. And it also depends on how they get used. Uh, for instance, uh, a game like the game of life, where the only thing that's really happening, you know, the money gets used and the little peg figures and cars get used, but the rest of it is kind of mostly on display or, or used once or twice mm -hmm. during the game versus a magic deck, which is going to get some pretty heavy use every yeah. time you're playing that game. Man, the, the shape my magic cards were in when I sold them was kind of disgusting. <laughs> and yeah, this the was edges. a thing, the, 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 the black schmutz that would gather on the corners of your cards so that your white bordered cards eventually turned into black border cards is kind of disturbing. And I, I think that was a bit of the ink coming off on your fingers and it just old magic cards. I don't know if that was something they ever improved or just everyone's sleeves, but like, I'm not a sleever. And looking at that now, I was just like, oh my God, my cards were in bad shape. So... Let's start talking about some things you can do. Again, do this as seriously as you think you need to. I, uh, we don't have hard set rules. This is what you must do to keep your game in great position. Here's what you need, must do to keep it near mint. That's not what this is going to be tonight. This is going to be a back and forth between Sean and I talking about various ways to protect games. It's up to you to decide which are ridiculous and which aren't. And then what I'd love to hear is comment. 
comment down below, send us feedback, direct message us, and tell us what worked for you. That, that I think, is going to be a more fun conversation after the fact than possibly what we're talking about here. I mean, and to be clear, uh, right up front, neither one of us are, you know, those mint inbox collectors of games. Correct. We play our games and yep. we, we, you know, we, that we, said, uh, I do try it. to keep mine in good condition, but that's just something I have had since I was a child where, you know, I still had the original box for my millennium Falcon and the instructions cause they belong there. <laughs> um, I was undiagnosed with anything, but I, there, there's enough things out there that I'm like, yeah, I think that might be me. Um, in, in the obsessiveness I had with my toys and collections and keeping things together. Sadly, my kids do not have that. So when I bring looping Louie to the barbershop bar, everyone will only have two chickens each instead of three. <laughs> so moving on to the first one, I want to talk stacking a bit. Okay. Cause this is huge. This is, this is, it, it's, it's the, which edition of D and D is better argument of board gaming. Should you store your games horizontal or vertical? The big thing here is to me, horizontal is better for the components. Vertical is better for the box. And to me, what would you rather protect? If you want your box to look shiny, yeah, put it this way. Because you're not going to get bowing. You're not going to stock things on top. Your corners aren't going to get rubbed. You're not going to catch the clips on the edges of your bookshelves. And your box is going to look pristine. But your components are very likely, even with a box insert, going to dump all over the place when you store vertically. And literally over time, now this takes a lot of time, boards can warp due to being held up this way. It's very unlikely. Most of the games you play, you're not going to play for enough years to have that happen. That's like you kept it up in your attic for a while type of problem. So it doesn't affect the average gamer. And yeah. many vertical boxers will say it never happens. I'm like, no, it just takes like, like years, 20, 30 years. It's, it's not going to happen in a few months. It's not going to happen in probably the lifetime of the game. So it's totally up to you which way you want to do it. But to me, if you are trying to keep your components organized and not rubbing into each other and not bouncing around, you're better horizontal. Now, one of the things that will make a big difference here is the board games you have, because a, a standard hobby board game, which is that more, more cube square ish, mm -hmm. um, is able to stand vertically. Whereas a, your old coffin box, the old Mattel boards, you know, your monopolies and things like that. Yeah, those are not, they designed. are not at all designed to be stored vertically. And so it's not even really an option if you are going with more of the mass market coffin style yeah. boxes. Well, I'll admit I have seen a gamer shelf where it was, you know, sorry, or cheesy, whatever, all mm. stood up this way. I not, would not this wanna, way. I've yet to see this, but this way. I would still not want to actually open that box and try and get it set up. Yeah. Well, and most of those boxes, though, your cleanup method was into yeah. the box. So at that point, it doesn't matter much. So again, I'm not going to get into any more detail about stacking, except to give you a few extra tips. Now, if you are concerned about things getting damaged, one of the things you can do if you is when you open your game, and we said this one a few times, I mentioned a lot on our unboxing videos, a pro tip that a lot of people don't know is once you punch the punch boards out, in most games, if you then put them under the insert, it then closes that gap. Because otherwise, if you throw the cardboard out, you'll have the gap for how thick the cardboard was by putting it underneath that should make it now flush with the top. So even for those of you storing vertically, that may keep your components in place. Do be I aware, still find though, that's a 50-50 yeah. proposition. Do be aware, though, I have seen more board games you've unboxed recently where the box lid doesn't close yes. in the shipping mode, and it's designed to, get, to throw out the punch boards. Yes. So pay attention when you're first unboxing if the box if it sticks closes up. or not. Yeah, basically, if that's the case, but put punch boards underneath till it works. Like, <laughs> put, put put them all and be like, oh, sticks up, take one out, try again. That, that's a tip I wish I had known years ago, and I do it for all of my games, and it does make a difference. Now, even better is if you somehow have a way to hold that box lid on tight, which gets into using um, elastics. Now, in general, you don't want to use elastic, like your standard tight elastic. Rubber, you don't rubber use elastics, the sort of things you use uh, in the office for elastics, the brown rubber, or even even the green and blue rubber ones that are that are thicker and wider. Please don't. Those are no, not good don't. for those are not good for paper products in general. Yes. Yeah. What you want is is there are things called box bands that are specifically made to hold boxes. There's another one called box tape where it's it's. Um, Tape that sticks to itself, so you just wrap it around the edge and it sticks to itself. Uh, you can even use paper strips. Um, bows. I saw someone using bows, and I'm like, that's kind of brilliant in a way. 
uh, using using ribbon to do it is better than elastic, but that's a way to keep them closed. Now, going back to tips for horizontal, if you are worried about stuff getting scuffed, put paper between the boxes. It also is a bonus. It's going to make it easier to slide your games apart. You don't have to grab the entire stack. So it's it's, it's a two-way street on this one. You're, you're getting two things out of it, but you need some kind of contact paper to put between every box. And you got to not be lazy when you take it out and let the paper fall on the floor and I'll pick it up later. And then you just end up with this mess all over your game room. Absolutely. That one's probably going a little excessive for most people, but yeah. if you really are worried, it is certainly a strong way to go. Just make sure you are using an acid free paper so mm -hmm. that you are not leaching uh, any of the color or anything out of the boxes. If yep. they're sitting there for a long time. Now, recently on Kickstarter, there's been a few of these is separators to put in your shelves. Now, these tend to be designed for the Ikea Kallax shelf, which is what almost every gamer seems to have. You can see one of them behind me, but that's not actually where I usually store my games. That's just to make a pretty backdrop for our podcast. Most of my shelves look like the one on the left, which is just a bunch of games on a bookshelf. Um, one of the things, if you're buying those, make sure you get thick enough shelves so they don't bow. But there are now these things that you basically... Uh, they're, they're they're cubby organizers. They're they're like the kind of things people have been buying for their closets for years. Someone has realized, hey, we can make these for board games. In particular, a recent one featured little shelves with little rollers on them, and the, your games would literally slide in and out. So you're getting to keep them horizontally, but actually separated from each other and on a roller system, so there's no rubbing and they come easily out. Now these are ridiculously expensive, and they and they space. take up room. <laughs> They, they are wasting, you're wasting a bunch of space inside your Calax. Yes. So, so Calax does tend to have some give, like the standard Calax box still gives you about an inch on every side to get your stuff out. So you're not wasting it that way, but the up and down is you're, you're adding about, you know, whatever, I don't know, quarter of an inch to an inch on top of every box. But again, that to me is over the top. But if you're really worried about protecting your games, that might be worth it. Absolutely. Now, again, one thing to keep in mind here is, the box is not the game. Your box mm -hmm. can go through a vast amount of beating and damage and things. And as long as it still manages to keep everything inside in nice, neat order, you're still able to play that game however long later. Yep. Yes, I, I find most of the average hobby gamers a little too obsessed over the quality of their box. Now, once you get inside the box, this might become more important. Yeah. Now, the next big debate is to sleeve or not to sleeve. I, I would say the average from what I've seen now seems to be on the side to sleeve. It seems like most gamers sleeve their games, uh, going to the trouble of finding specific sleeves for specific games with specific card sizes. I am not a sleever. I don't like the feel of sleeve cards. I hate the way they stack and fall over, and I hate shuffling them. Plus, I don't like I bring my some of my games to public play events and I will admit I have sleeved a couple games. But if you look at how often the cards are used and touched, that's how I make the decision. So I sleeved Star Realms because Star Realms for a while was getting played at every event multiple times. I kept my deck in my pocket. My wife and I play at coffee shops. I was playing a lot of Star Realms and that is another heavy shuffling dueling card game where you're constantly touching and sh shuffling the cards. We are also considering sleeving Aventuria, potentially, because of how often we expect to play it, especially the character decks, because we don't want those to wear out. In general, though, uh, unless you're playing something like Magic with that heavy replay and lots of shuffling constantly, we sometimes multiple times a week, cards are made to be used. Uh, and, and sleeving is an expense. Um, it is... A, Often a, a, more than the cost hitch. of the game. Yeah. yeah. Now, one time, now one benefit, the real benefit to sleeving is every once in a while, you'll get games where the expansions come out and all of a sudden the card backs have changed just a little bit or the sizing or of lot. the card or the, or a lot, or the sizing of the card has changed, changed just a bit. And you don't want that whole, the, 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 the ability to, you know, look at the back of somebody's hands and go, Oh, well, they've got something from that, yeah, from that expansion and that expansion and that expansion. That means I better do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that case, some of the custom backed sleeves can be a huge benefit. Yep. But that's not protecting your game. That's making up for a mess up on yeah. behalf of the publisher. 
Yeah, and honestly, another another aspect of that, again, not protecting your game, is to be able to tell your cards apart from someone else's. Especially in games where you have to pass cards to other players or whatever. If you've got your own sleeves, you know those are your cards. So yeah, sleeving debate, I go for it. If, if you are at all concerned, this is probably the number one thing that's going to protect your card games the most. If you double sleeve especially, which to me is going a little too far, you tend to even get waterproofing almost. You can deal with spills. Sleeving also has the benefit if you can you can wash them, you can clean them as they, as they get mucky. Uh, sleeving really does make some sense to me. It just it's the added expense and the amount of time spent doing it to me is just not worth it. I know I'm completely on the same page there. And Next then uh, interestingly, Darkling Blight in the chat says they find sleeved cards easier to shuffle. See, I find them harder. Now I do know there's like all kinds of YouTube videos on how to how to shuffle sleeve cards, but yeah. So sleeving is a big one. Um, sleeving and stacking. Pick how you're going to stack your cards. Pick how you're going to sleeve them. To me, those are kind of like like the the bare minimum. Like like those. That's your bare minimum protection. Is is store your games in a way they're not going to get damaged and sleeve them to protect the components. Now the rest of this to me is going a little bit more above and beyond, which you may or may not want to do. So next up, we've got uh, a bunch of different box options. So you can protect your box. But maybe that box that you got with the game isn't the right solution at all. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's better to find a new box. We've talked, if you, if you watch any of our unboxings, Bo will almost always call out if the box is, you know, air. Uh, mostly air or if it's only got the trough insert, which will get it to you safely. But as soon as you, you know, unwrap your cards and unpunch the deck or un unpunch the cards, it's completely useless for keeping everything safe and neat and separated. Right. Yeah. And reboxing is a thing. Um, a great example of this, and, and Owen's in our chat, so he knows exactly what I'm talking about, because that's the first time I saw it, is there are a number of people who had had the brilliant idea, I don't know who started it, to buy photo boxes, which are these plastic cases with little tiny individual cases where you put your family photos or whatever in it and you label each one. These are fantastic for transporting a high number of small portable games in one place that also end up like if you buy the good ones, like they're waterproof and everything else. And you can like bring them on the boat without having to worry that, you know, your game falls into the lake. Like, yeah, now once you're out playing, you got to be a little mm -hmm. careful, but the, the, the concept of this is awesome. And I've seen other people do, I've seen people who rebox their board games into a, a manila envelope style drawer and every game's in a Ziploc bag and they're just tagged. And because all they need is the components. The other option that I've seen done a lot, uh, and this is a sort of a hobby of its own, is reboxing into just smaller boxes. So when you mm -hmm. look at the box and, and we talk about how much empty air, air is in it, well, they take that. Out. So if it's, you know, the, the boxes all of a sudden are half the size of the original and you can fit more onto a shelf and you can pack them more snugly and, and mm -hmm. more efficiently into a uh, into your shelving units. And, and again, that can actually protect things because there's less so not, room for things to move around inside yep. your box. No, exactly. Um, another thing, too, with this is if you are the collector type, you can't have to throw out the old box. You could. I, I've seen this once and I thought it was kind of brilliant. And it, to me, it reminded me of something I'd seen at the local library is the person had the shelf of games behind them. The, the Calax with the square boxes with some stacked this way, some stacked this way, and some just like showing it off. But then when you actually asked to play the game, they went over to a different area of their house in a closet and pulled out drawers and pulled out the components in cardboard pizza boxes because the cardboard pizza boxes all fit everything better. And I'm like, wow, like, like they still have their display, right? They have their, oh, look at my collection. They have their hoard and their hoards in mint condition. If they ever go to sell these games, they just have to put the stuff back in the original box and it'll look great. But they get the added bonus of not ever possibly damaging it because it's stored separately. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then the other option, of course, is what happens when your game outgrows its box. Yeah. Uh, and you can see uh, just behind me there, there's my original multiverse box. Uh, and then just out of the camera sight is the new multiverse box that I have upgraded to. Uh, so I've actually upgraded my my box, my big box expansion to a new big box Bigger expansion. box expansion. And, and in theory, we've already realized that it's not quite big enough and it could use to be a little bigger still yeah, <laughs> yeah another so. example of this is uh the, a good one is space base space base put out the command station 
which they were nice to give you some extra stuff that literally is about protecting your game because it gives you a place to store all the space-based stuff that's out, including all of the expansions, including even the most recent one, to fit in there. But it also gave you sleeves for space-based cards, which are very hard to find because space-based cards are like cards divided in half or a third. I'm not even sure. They're long, skinny cards. And it gave you a box insert that holds everything in its place. And I'm like, that is fantastic. Um, another example of this that's not quite as nice, but when we got Core Worlds and then Galactic Orders came out, Core Worlds won't fit Galactic Orders, but Galactic Orders will fit Core Worlds. So the expansion came in a larger box in order to fit the base game, which is kind of backwards, but I thought it was a nice way to do it. Absolutely. And then uh, other uh, other solutions, sometimes like the multiverse, they just put out a box. Uh, there, there, were a, there was a small card set with it, but for the size of the box you get, you get a small deck of cards, yeah. but the ability to hold a huge deck uh, or collection of decks and the other games have done this like smash up for instance, mm-hmm. which has at least one, if not two, uh, big, yeah, the big geeky boxes, box, big geeky box. Uh, and these also often come with extra dividers or fancier dividers to mm-hmm. keep things all neat and organized, which again, keeping things neat and organized helps longevity because you don't yes. have to mess around with things to find and hunt and peck as much. Now, the next one I have is right above my head here, for those that can see it on the show, is gamer luggage, carrying cases, ways to move your stuff around. So what's right above me is my quiver from Quiver Time. Uh, We haven't talked about them in a long time, but we actually, they were a sponsor of the show for a while. We did a review of the quiver. Look up my quiver review. I love this piece of gamer luggage. It is specifically designed for card games. But it has movable pouches. It's got um, like a fishnet thing at the top for instructions or tokens. And I know people who bring, I think someone, the record I saw was something like 32 different games in their quiver. Now, a bunch of those were the like 18 card love letter style games. But still, my current quiver is still packed from, um, oh, what con did we go to? Breakout con. And I think I've got seven games in there. I, I've got my my Keyforge decks just in case someone wants to play Keyforge. I've got um sentinel comics i think is in there and i got a bunch of other stuff because it let me put it all in one place but like not only is it a good way to transport my game it everything's snug nothing sliding around and with that i'm also using the plastic deck boxes which you can also see over my shoulder so i put the cards are sleeved and a deck box in a quiver those cards are not getting damaged yeah and my quiver has uh, it's not actually on display right now but it's got uh a bunch of decks of also of um um, uh, game Keyforge, game. Keyforge, Keyforge decks, but it's all. I've also got a wrestling uh, board game, a wrestling card game. But uh, go. I've got several teams and 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 uh, sort of uh, tag teams and, and and wrestlers all sorted out in that with tokens and dice. Uh, it's it's just a fantastic way to do things. Uh, unfortunately, it's nowhere near big enough to hold DC deck building. You'd need uh, not all at once. You'd need <laughs> two, maybe three quivers to hold uh, the same as the multiverse box. You need a quiver of quivers and and a, and a much more padded shoulder strap too. It's yes. <laughs> and and there are other of these. Like uh, Sean and I were just looking at a a fantastic. It looked like a piece of suitcase luggage that you would unzip for card games. And I was like, oh, that would be perfect for bringing a Venturia somewhere. Yeah. Now, I even have, and again, you, it's over my shoulder there. There's a wooden box there. It's a card box that currently has my Aventuria stuff in it. But to go with that, down under that is a binder. That is a great way to protect your cards if it's a game where you're going to pick through the cards. If, you, if you're not going to just bring, bring a deck, you need to flip through and grab cards. Binders are great for that. I think anyone who's collected sports cards knows what I'm talking about. Um, and many, again, Magic Pokemon players also use these. Yeah, if so you're doing card that construction way. prior to the game, to the event, it's a great way to you know flip yeah. through and go. Oh, I need one of these and one of these and one of these and one of these. Yep. Or any card game where you're like picking a character and there's like sets of character cards that go with them. There's a lot of adventure games. I could even see it for like Gloomhaven though. Gloomhaven comes with nice little boxes. Yeah. All right. Enough about cards and boxes. Let's move on to the other components in your game and i'm going to move on to tokens or chits or whatever else you want to call counters is another one and this is a brilliant one i have not personally used but i know people who have done and that is using coin capsules coin capsules are little plastic things for holding coins coin collectors use them 
You can get these dirt cheap pretty much anywhere online, your usual online game stores, uh, sorry, online mass market stores. I have never seen these in a game store, though, which maybe that's a game store should get in on this. Um, you buy them and then you put your tokens in them. Um, first time I saw this done was for the game Above and Below when they're little round tokens. The next time I saw it done, it was for Quacks of Quedlinburg, which is a brilliant way to make those tokens. All, they all still feel the same, but protects them. Because I got to say, Quacks is one. The more you shuffle around that cardboard, the more it's getting beat up every time you play it. That is one that, that definitely is something to, to worry about, which we'll get to, a, in my opinion, better way to protect that game in a minute. But coin capsules can be used for anything. I've seen historic war gamers using coin capsules for their square tokens. It's, they come in various sizes. Um, there are other, I will just call them collector's capsules. You can also look up besides just coins, but coins is the easiest one to find. Yeah. And I mean, you're looking at, uh, at 200 for under $30 Canadian. Yes. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very, uh, cost efficient way to do it. If you've got, uh, you know, the right number of components that are the right size for what you can find available. Uh, so and that's a way to protect your, your tokens and stuff, but then there's the board itself. There are a number of people. The first time I ever heard of this was snakes and lattes, which was uh, Canada's first big, um, board game cafe and they kind of started the trend of board game cafes where they varnish all of their boards they have spray varnish in general you want a matte varnish unless the board is already glossy then you might want a gloss varnish uh for best protection you want to hit it with gloss varnish and then matte varnish the thing is some varnishes don't work well with some dyes and some varnishes will yellow over time now i wish i could point you to a specific one because we have been asked to review one multiple times and i don't know what's happened where it keeps falling through where it hasn't shown up and i have to write them and but there is now a company that makes board game varnish um personally i recommend testers dull coat but if you can anytime you're going to varnish anything try it first so if you are varnishing specifically tokens or components pretty much every punch board comes with one or two extra blank bits try it on those if you have to do a bit of the punch board itself that has color on it for a board, do a corner, do a small corner, see how it sits, let it, let it go a week at least, and then decide if you want to do the whole board. Apparently, uh, Krylon UV resistant matte finish is what yeah. snakes and lattes actually used. There you go. So you, like snakes and lattes, those games are played by hundreds of people. They're one of the most popular board cafe game cafes in the world. Uh, one so, thing to note though, if you are doing a spray treatment like this, do outside. it in do it outside and do not expect to play that game right away there is a an aroma that needs to fade from the board so <laughs> you know doing it in the afternoon and trying to play it that night could get everyone a little uh giddy during the yeah, uh, possibly and then uh darkling blight in the chat is saying acrylic based clear coat might work as well yeah, that, that's actually varnish. what it, what the Krylon is for from uh, the Krylon uh, product is. I do not recommend Mod Podge. Um, I have a board downstairs that my daughter chose to protect with Mod Podge, and well, it'll probably never be damaged ever. It is not a smooth surface anymore. Mod Podge tends to take on the texture of your brush and everything on it, so it, it is not perfectly smooth. Which it depends on the game. Fair enough. And while well, we can't fold the board back up anymore ever it's right. now a big <laughs> square <laughs> varnish not an option or something you don't want to do again it's it's expensive it's stinky and and you're not going to know if your game's going to yellow in five years or 10 or 15 that's that's the hard part about that now testers dull coat i have used on many miniatures that i painted back in the 90s that are still perfectly fine but that's miniatures and not cardboard so it's hard to tell so another option that won't damage your stuff if you can find a big enough one to do it is to laminate things. Now, yes, you could laminate a whole board. I've done it. Um, in particular, the splotter unmounted boards are great for this because they're really they're just thick card. They're well worth laminating just to protect them because they're just thick card. And if you get any liquid on them whatsoever, it's just going to soak right in. Um, the other thing I've used it for, and it's a bit of the RPG side of things, is dungeon maps. It used to be, I played D&D &D 4E the most, and it had a ton of these awesome fold-out maps while I laminated them all. Um, the added bonus of that is you can then use dry and wet erase markers on them, which was very useful in Dungeons & Dragons. Maybe not as useful for your board games, but besides boards, it's all the other stuff. The You technically could laminate a whole deck of cards. 
I probably wouldn't go to that level, but like the player reference sheets, the thin card player boards, um, anything published by Stonemaier Games and their thin card, they, they love their thin card. Uh, the Terraforming Mars, for example, the, those thin card boards, I, I, all of it can be laminated. Honestly, a laminator is a purchase any alpha gamer should buy. They're, you're going to find something you're going to want to laminate, and you're going to be like, oh my God, this is awesome, and I'm going to keep laminating things. Yeah, no, and, and RPG players, especially, uh, you know, if you, if you play RPGs as well as board games, even more of a reason to get a laminator because yes. you can protect those character sheets and, and all those reference cards and your spell lists or whatever you want. Uh, it's yep. fantastic. Now, the other thing with laminating is, uh, again, you can use dry erase, but the, you, you, the one thing to be aware of is don't use it as an excuse to be more environmentally friendly. Now, this is about protecting your games. Laminating is going to protect your stuff. So on this argument where we're talking about protecting games, all good, laminating. On the other side, if you've got a roll and write with a thousand sheets and you're like, well, I'll just laminate one instead of using those thousand sheets and I'll save trees, you're actually not. It works the other way around. The the environmental impact and CO2 footprint for thousands of sheets of paper, you need thousands and thousands to make up for one sheet of plastic you put into the world that won't biodegrade and so on. Yeah, now that there's there's some weirdness here because if you've already got a laminator and you already have the plastic sheets that you know and and you're not going to be throwing them out you're going to be protecting something for the long term yes that's a different story again one year first one uh, single use plastics are horrible Mm -hmm. we want to avoid them you don't want to plastic coat anything that is going to be and thrown out in any in the foreseeable future but as a way to protect things over the long term Mm -hmm. plastic can be a solid uh, option all right the next thing Instead of putting your stuff in coin capsules, oh, I'm going to jump back a bit. Coin capsules. Red Meeple Ryan's not in our chat room tonight. He's one of our regulars that happens to be a vision impaired Meeple. And he usually calls me out on this. He uses coin capsules to make his games playable as well as protect components because he has, um, what's the stud, the dot stuff? Braille. Language. Braille. He has Braille tape and he puts Braille tape on his coin capsules to say what the, co- the things are. And he's much rather put them on coin capsules rather than put them on physical components. So that's jumping back a bit. But another option to protect your components is buy better ones, which sounds kind of silly, but there is an entire market of upgrading your board game components. And most of these are switching from easily damaged, easily, especially water, beverage, coffee, wine, soaked chits and counters into something plastic that can be cleaned uh, or Bakelite. Or wood. Wood is even easier to clean. Isn't as easy to clean, but definitely easier to clean than a piece of soggy cardboard. Absolutely. There's definitely some benefits to, you know, having these upgraded components, but also not getting rid of the original components so that you still have that, you know, mint in box. If if, it should be, if that's what you want, uh, component available, should anything else happen, should you lose Mm -hmm. a piece, et cetera. But you also have these generally hardier, uh, more durable components that also generally, you know, make the game better to play. That's one of the original reasons yes. for the upgrades is to make the game more enjoyable for play. It just yep. happens to be that they're also more durable as well. In general, yeah, most upgrades are more durable. Uh, we talked about elastics for boxes. It's same thing for cards and stuff inside your game. Just it, it just search board game elastic, and you'll find alternatives to your standard hairband or whatever people have been using for years. I cry when I open up games. I, I, we did some thrifting uh, last weekend and opening up some games and finding various things held together by, by either hairbands or, or those super thick brown tan elastics and, and digging into corners of cards. Oh, it was frightening. And then the, they were left too long, so they've now become brittle and are stuck to the... Uh, there are alternatives yep. in general. Avoid elastics, oh, but that, there hey, are Velcro options. Cable wraps can work. I mean, <laughs> yes. Yeah, there you go. I don't. Oh, no, it's a clip. I used a clip on this one. I was going to say, <laughs> do I have a cable wrap here? All right. This is now kind of getting more out there on some of the stuff. But um, one of the things to do to protect your game is avoid humidity. If you are in a humid place, have a dehumidifier. I have one in my basement where my games are. It is not literally in the game room. It's in it's in my laundry room next to it. 
but it does help if you have central air and get to get a dehumidifier. That was also going to matter. Um, go with that. We they um, Carlos actually hinted at it. Silica gel packs actually exist to keep humidity out of your board game boxes. If you live somewhere humid, um, keep them in your boxes. Like there's, there's don't toss those out just because you're like, oh, why'd they throw this in here? They will prevent mold and and humidity getting into your game. Just make sure you keep them away from children. There's a reason why they say do not eat. And that's because they will absorb all the moisture in your stomach, too. Yeah. Now, there is at least one board gamer I know who takes this to a higher level. If you really, really, really care about your collection, you could get a moisture, humidity, and temperature controlled room to store your games in. People do it for scars. People do it for cardboard. Absolutely. It, it, it all depends on how far you want to take the protection and collection and protection of your collection in the board game world. Uh, yes. All the, all the available steps are there. If you want a humidor for your board games, it's, it exists. It does exist. Now, one of the things Sean's already mentioned a few times, the big thing you want to do with your components and why you might want upgraded components that don't get banged up or why you might want to use coin capsules is you want to stop things from rubbing. Um, in particular, anything that's painted or silk screened, and one of the things that's great for this are box inserts, things that keep the various components separate. I know people who cry whenever they open a game and there are cards and dice both sitting loose because those dice are going to roll around and those cards are probably going to get dinged up, especially if they happen to be, you know, game science spiky dice and not just like some nice rounded wooden D6s. So that is one good way to, to help. And then the other thing is just taking it to actual component separate. Now, baggies are great for this. Like, baggies will usually do. That'll be enough to keep your various components apart from each other. But possibly better would be any kind of, like, plastic capsule holder, which I have some behind me, but you can't really see them. But they're picked up at the dollar store. They're kind of in the corner of the Calax there. Um, we technically get them out of our kids' clay, air-dry clay. Those are really good for individual components, where if you don't want the spiky stars with the spiky pyramids, if you really want to take it that far, then you can separate those out. Personally, I just put all one player's colors all in one bag, and I'm even evil enough. I'll toss a card in there, too, as long as it's a reference card, not a play card. Just so it's to me, it's more important to be able to go, here's all your stuff and start playing that it is that that card doesn't have a scuff on it. Absolutely. Again, most you, you want to be able to play the game quickly and easily. You want to be able to get it back, put away quickly and easily, and you want to minimize the damage over the long term. Again, all of these things that we're talking about damage wise, very rarely is it going to be the second time you play the game because you put it all in the box. Everything's yeah. going to be ruined, but over a period of time, the mm -hmm. more of the, the more, the more you shake it, the more you move it around, the more things shuffle is the more wear and tear your game yeah. is taking. Now, here's an interesting one that may not affect most people, but something I hadn't thought of. But I remember when um, local game store moved to a new corner with nice big windows where you could see inside. And they originally had their board game collection so you could see it from the street. And it looked awesome. You're like, look at all the games they have. I think it took a week and a half before those games started to fade. Hugin and Munin, the game store before that, did have one set of their shelf to the window. And I think it was part of an inside joke just to see how faded those board game boxes will be. Do not store your games in direct sunlight. And that includes through a window. You can get UV protecting protective layers to put up there. But generally speaking, your windows are not going to do that unless you yeah. have deliberately put up a layer of UV protection. Your games will fade. Period. Now, if you're doing the UV protection Krylon, maybe you do that on your box as well as your board so you can, you know, show off your neighbors, your Calax in the window. That's that's your choice. <laughs> but just remember, you're also showing that off to anyone else who happens to be lurking around and peeking in your windows. Yes. And the, you've true. kept these nice, fancy games in perfect condition for uh, hopefully not. <laughs> Now, this is one that, that I know people who do. Now, this is this is actually common in wargaming, where you have paper hex encounter boards. That's a common thing. Many war games are very um, mom and pop made in the back room printed out type things. For years, they have been. Now, 
GMT games and other modern publishers have definitely shining them up. But I've seen many of those. RPG maps are another case. But putting something over your game board to protect it. Now, I have seen this done with Lexan. I've seen it done with plexiglass. I've seen it done with literal glass. I've seen acrylic and more. Often, this has the benefit of giving you a wet or dry race surface on top as well. And the other thing for RPG fans is you can get these with a grid. So you can add a grid to any map by using it. Now, for board games, I have never physically seen anyone do this, but I know a game group that I game with, I haven't been to their house, that does this for every game. They have a thin sheet that goes on top of every game they play so that the board doesn't get scratched. And you can also do this just as easily if you have a table, you get a layer of clear acrylic that goes over the table and mm -hmm. you, you know, pick it up, put the board down, put the, uh, the acrylic back down on top yep. and play your game without having to worry about scratching or damaging the board. Now, the last one I've got, Sean may have some more that I hadn't thought of yet, is uh, just a pretty simple one. This is one I definitely do. Keep your games off the floor. Um, learn this the hard way. Even in upper stories, like it doesn't necessarily be your basement. It just prevents damage from potential spills. Or when you're mopping the floor, when you're cleaning, just, just up an inch even. Put it on some type of shelf. And if it is in the basement... Be aware of whether or not you, were ba you have uh, flooding issues in your area. Be aware of the mm -hmm. potential for flooding because nothing you do will protect your game should a flood happen. Yeah. That's almost guaranteed a write-off of your game just with just about anything you've done to it because mold. Yeah. <laughs> Everything collects mold. So that's one. Oh, of another the, one, uh, too, is I, I would recommend keep your games in the house. Seems kind of a silly one, but I've, I've seen people who have games in their deck boxes they bring out, bring them in during the winter when it's going to rain. Um, keeping your games in your garage, only if it's like a temperature controlled garage. I have a friend who did that for years, thought it was great, but then suddenly got a leak roof, or a roof leak, and lost a, a huge collection of games because they always gamed in the garage and it was perfectly fine. Garages are not built to the same standard that houses are. Now, the next thing is not necessarily about uh, how you are keeping your board game, but uh, how everyone is keeping yeah. your board game when it comes out to the table. Yeah, we want to talk a bit about some gameplay etiquette. Um, like, I'm not don't do this yourself. Like, don't do this yourself. But like, somehow communicate to the people you're playing with that this is just not cool. Don't bend, fold, twist, turn, crumple anything unless that's part of the game which you tend to only really see in the exit games and escape room games where you're folding things. I'd seen way too many gamers. I'm sitting at the FLGS. We're playing games and some dudes like flicking their cards and I'm like, I'm sorry, can you stop that? And they're like, well, it's not your game. And I'm like, no, it's his over there. And I don't care. That's not good for his game. Like, unless he comes over and tells me you're allowed to fiddle around and twist and, and make little tubes out of your cards. Um, and I've even had someone say it and they're like, oh, it's my game. And I'm like, yeah, but it sets a bad example. It makes people think they can do that. And this even goes as far as uh, tapping. If you've got a hand of cards and you're tapping it on the table firmly, you can really yeah. blunt and damage the edges of, edges of cards. Um, there's just overhandling cards can be a really bad just thing the, the, in general. The constant shift of... Oh, yeah, people can hear this. We can't see it. <laughs> I only have one card, so it doesn't work. But even this, the you know... Poker yeah. chips, I think, are made to be stacked and unstacked. Yeah. You can get away with those. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, you cards, do that with my iron clays, I might get upset though. The more the more you are handling the cards, uh, the more you might, might want to think about sleeving them, <laughs> because yes. again, that's you know protecting those, especially edges. Edges are one of the biggest yeah. things on cards. Edges and yeah, edges, corners, they start to split. Now another one. Honestly, my rule is 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 no food or drink at the table at best. Like, just don't don't have a meal at, while you're playing a game. Save that, eat first, take a break, whatever. I know people like snacks and people like drinks. And while well, you all should be drinking more water, reminder, everyone take some water. Uh, everyone should try to stay hydrated. Maybe, maybe it's a beer and pretzels game. My rule is none on the game table. I have side tables for that. I have six of them in my game room and I put them between people. Every person can easily reach one if they're all out in play. Um, that way, if something does spill, it spills on the side table and then my game room floor and my game room floor is tile. So I'm good. Not on the actual table. Now, better, no food or drink at all. 
But I get it. People snacking is part of game night. It always will be part of game night. And so if you are going to snack, though, do the whole avoid the sticky, saucy, powdery things. We've talked about this many times on game night etiquette and dealing with player problems. Make sure your treats are appropriate to keeping things clean. Make sure there are lots of uh, paper towels, washcloths, ways for people to wipe off their hands between turns and handling things. Just make it so that people can touch things in clean ways. Yeah, like we always have coffee and or tea at the table, but it's yes. on the side tables. Off the table. Uh, because it, <laughs> we have seen what happens when it isn't on the table. Uh, see our uh, replays of uh, Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven, for, yes. Uh, examples. At, at least two, I think. Um, another one I'm going to call out, wash your hands before you start playing, possibly between games and at the end of the night, and even more so if you've eaten in between. Or if you go to uh, the bathroom, wash your hands. Yes, yes. Like, like this is something at this point I expected everyone to have learned during the ongoing pandemic and be better at. Uh, it seems like when we decided the pandemic was done that people didn't have to wash their hands anymore either, which is disgusting. Uh, the whole point of this is to prevent the spread of nastiness between players and 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 whether that's nastiness getting on the games or anything else or in the form of of uh, diseases to just schmutz, right? Like, uh, show up to the game night, right? You're at public play game night. Hopefully you wash your hands before you left home. Go into the washroom for a minute before playing the game. Wash your hands, please. Yeah, and I mean, this is, you know, we were talking, we were joking earlier about the black stuff on the edges of magic cards. Uh, but that's... That's what what happens is, you know, things get on your on your hands. Oil, your hands have oil Are on gross. them. That's part <laughs> of what happens with your skin. Your skin yes. exudes oil and that picks up things and that deposits them onto cards. So I guess one we didn't mention above, um, which if you want to take it to that, if you're trying to keep your games in pristine shape, uh, do what you do when you get an old archive book. Wear gloves. There's no reason you don't wear gloves playing games. Uh, that, to me, it's going a little too far, but I'm not trying to put my games in a museum at the end of all this. Though, to be fair, uh, most museums don't actually use gloves for their paperwork uh, work anymore because they have determined that they need some oil and they get dried out and brittle and crack if you <laughs> use gloves and only uh, and only touch them with gloves. Well, I don't think that's going to be a problem with anyone's board <laughs> games. So <laughs> Now, I'm going to take the opposite side here. We've talked a lot about protecting your games and all the various things you can do to keep them in the best possible condition. Uh, mm -hmm. Or as Carl said, so that when, when some, when his family comes around, uh, when they've been hooked into the board game thing, all those games are ready for them to play. Well, I have, and my kids have board games that have been in my family for between 50 and 70. And I think some even old longer years. Mm -hmm. Sure, the boxes are a little beat up, but these games are still perfectly playable. We haven't used Ziploc bags. We haven't used, you know, Kallax shelves or anything else. Uh, they have been near, uh, thankfully none of them through floods, but they have been all too terrifyingly close to floods. But they've just been used. Uh, and, and really, none of the things, the things we've talked about on this list have been done to these games. They're all using the original whatever came in the box to separate the pieces together or lack thereof. Uh, and, you know, 50, 70 years later, my kids can still play them. I can still play them. Uh, I was still playing with, with other people in family at Christmas, yep. a 1972 board game that has never been treated with any special care. Yeah, to be fair, we treat them with respect. You know, I was brought up understanding that a board game was not something that you twisted and torn and, 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 you know, as we were, as we were mentioning here, but that's just basic respect for your property, as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned, um, which is the absolute minimum we should be expecting for everyone who is playing for everyone, these yes. board games. Yeah, I'll, I'll admit, I take this a little further than Sean. When I go back and replay my old games, I tend to then bag the components when I put them away. But that's more for having it sorted and ready to play than it is about protecting them. That's the whole, here's your green player stuff, here's your red player stuff, instead of dump everything on the board and everyone starts sorting stuff. Or it's a way to organize the cards. Uh, so most recently, I actually did this with my Talisman 2nd Edition, which up until this point, this is a very collectible, worth a ton of money game, literally got the box dump at the end of every game session. 
literally like we didn't even sort the cards into decks. We just dumped it all in. And then when I went to play, I would dump the entire box on the table. And the start of the game was sort everything by its card backs and sort the chits over here and, you know, put the dice over there. And, and we started playing. But I couldn't take it. I'm like, like now that I, I I care more about hobby games and the shape of my games, I, I everything's baggied now. Now, I didn't get a box insert. I didn't do anything like that. But like all of my spells are in one. All of my adventure decks are in another baggie. All of my characters are in a baggie and so on. I will say that the the I think one of the oldest games in my collection, I did put into uh, a couple of bags for the Christmas game. But that's only because we learned that the designer doesn't want you to use all of the cards that were provided. So I needed a way to separate out the, uh, the publisher yep. uh, card card build versus the designers card build. Uh, but and the other thing too, which we, we didn't talk about tonight is repairing games, which could be an interesting follow-up topic sometime in the future, but in general tape's not bad. The box corner splits. Don't write the publisher and say, I've had this game for a week and the box corner. No, tape it up. It's a game. Use some glue. Component breaks. Use super glue. Like, like I don't know. I, people can take this too far. Absolutely. Again, once you open this, it's not as bad as a car. You're not losing, you know, 40% of the value when you drive it off the lot. But you are using value and the more you play it and the more love you get out of it, it goes up in value for your family, but down mm -hmm. for everyone else. So worrying about resale value, unless you are specifically buying with an intent to, as some of most friends do upgrade the game and sell it at a profit at the end, mm -hmm. odds are good that resale value is negligible. It's, yeah. it's just something you don't need to be concerned about. Uh, unless you are taking that into account when you purchase the game. Yeah. And board games are like comic books. Lots of people like to talk about how they go up in value, but they really don't. That market doesn't really exist. Yes, there are exceptions. There are a few out of print board games that may never be reprinted. I'm going to say may because some of them have been coming back. We didn't expect like say dark tower, um, but may or hero quest, even for that example, another example, that's a game that used to sell for a fortune. Um, but that's so few and far between, and you just have to be lucky. Obsessively keeping a thousand games in pristine collection shape is going to be worth way, like cost you way more than the two out of that thousand that are actually worth money eventually. Yeah, the like odds just, that you have Action Comics number one are slim and none. <laughs> yeah. So don't 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 assume that you do. Assume that you don't, and yes. care for things, but don't. Ex, you know, don't don't go out of your way to to make sure you know everyone wipes their hands with a moist moist wipe and and you know before their turn. Before, you can, like return. if that's what you want to do, do it. I just I think that's going too far. Again, you have to balance protection versus enjoyment of the game. And I have always said for a long time, and and I'm now I've been in the the, the hobby long enough that I'm excuse me seeing a small problem with this is if I play a card game in particular, say a deck builder enough times that my cards are damaged. I have gotten so much enjoyment out of that game. I owe the publisher and I'm just going to buy another copy. Now where this becomes a problem. And this is what I'm seeing now is as we've lost a lot of publishers, especially in the last five years is the games go to print. And there are now games. I wished I had sleeved because there is no way for me to replace them now. But for years, like from 2020 to 2018, or sorry, 2000 to about 2018, most of the good games were still in print. I could still get them, even going like Bonanza being one of the older. It's like 1998. If I ruin my Bonanza cards, I go to Amiga and buy a new set of Bonanza. But now we're starting to see these older games that aren't getting the reprint. So now I'm like, all right, I get sleeving a bit more. But my old, I used to always say it. I'm like, I'm not going to sleeve a game. If I play a game enough to ruin it, the designer, owe, I, I owe them for another copy for the amount of enjoyment I got out of it. Fair enough. Well, I think there you have some of our suggestions for keeping your games in the best shape possible or the shape you need. <laughs> well, what do you do to protect your games? Let us know about it in the comments below, because we're sure there are opinions out there. Yes, I want to hear the opinions on this one. Even better, um, instead of commenting, head over to our Discord. That's at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Let's keep the conversation going. I would love to hear what some people have done 
what people think is a little over the top, or if you're aghast that we don't do more. Finally, if you've got a question for us like Carlos, head over to tabletopbellhop.com, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Just please, I don't care if your sister's eating your Uno deck.